Welcome to Hotera's Presents, a brand agnostic interview podcast that seeks to objectively highlight the happenings within the world of diagnostics. And now, your hosts, Rich Thayer and Mickey Yade. Hello, and welcome to Hal Terrace Presents. My name is Rich Thayer, Managing Partner at Hal Terrace. And this is Mickey Yarday, Founder and Partner at Hal Terrace. And this is our first episode in a three-part series on tuberculosis. Today, we are interviewing Dr. Morton Ruwald, Director of the TB Program at FIND. Morton gave us a great deal of insight into what's going on in the diagnostics world, particularly with regard to new diagnostics, and we think you're going to be very interested in this episode. And now, enjoy our episode with Morton Ruwald. Hello, Morton. Thanks so much for joining us today. We uh, look very much forward to speaking with you about TB and all the work that you and FIND are doing. So, Morton, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm a medical doctor trained in, in Copenhagen in, in Denmark. I think I've always had sort of a an interest in immunology, and and that's kind of how I got into to science, I guess. Um, as a medical student, I, I spent some time on sort of immuno-oncology, mouse models, and cancer vaccination stuff. And that then later slided into to interest in infectious diseases. I did a couple of clinical years before getting into a PhD program on TB immunology and biomarkers and Pretty rapidly on that, just after half a year for postdoc, I ended with my own research group on TB, on diagnostics, and then that later led to vaccine research, mainly on TB, um, translational stuff, chlamydia vaccines for a while, but it has been TB a lot. I used to work at the Staten Serum Institute in in Copenhagen, but uh, for the past four years, I've led the TB program at FIND where we work on a really wide range of, of TB diagnostics, spanning AI and digital diagnostics, uh, all the way to, to complex sequencing-based uh, tests. Yeah, so that's me in a nutshell. Excellent, excellent. What led you to, to focus on, on diagnostics over time, since you had that broad experience in TB? Yeah, that's a good one, Mickey. Um, everyone who's been doing TB vaccine research knows that that is big, large, long clinical <laughs> trials. Um, and, you know, it's super important. Uh, but I think after, after working on TB vaccines for, for, for almost seven years, I thought when this opportunity came up at, at FIND, it was, was a chance for me to get into faster science. You could say diagnostic trials are much shorter. You amend your protocols much more, and you have a lot more flexibility. It's an interesting, more dynamic space to be in. Yeah, makes a lot yeah. of sense. Well, thank you, Morton. That's a fantastic background and perfect for uh, the world of tuberculosis. We've seen the positive effects that rapid global engagement to fight disease can have, for example, in the 50s and 60s for smallpox, and more recently, HIV and Ebola, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. While TB has been affecting mankind now for more than 9,000 years, far longer than these other diseases, there is a general consensus that not enough is being done globally to combat this disease. What are some of the reasons for this historically inadequate response and what role might improved diagnostics play? Hmm. Yeah, well, TB is definitely not an easy pathogen to, to start with. The mycobacteria, they often carry drug resistance genes that makes them really hard to kill with antibiotics. MTB has one of the most complex and impenetrable cell walls. The bacteria happily lives inside human cells. They've co-evolved with humankind. And therefore, they are very, very well adapted as a human pathogen. You know, this bacteria makes sure that before it kills the person it's infected, it gets transmitted to the family uh, or the, the contacts around it. Um, so it's a really, really smart uh, pathogen. And to make things even more complex, it, it infects the deep parts of the lung, so it's hard to get to, especially in the early stages of disease. We rely way too much on, on sputum as a sample, and it's a really, really tricky sample to, to work with. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a clever bug. 
it's unfortunately also specialized in causing disease in the most disadvantaged people in the world. So um, yeah, it's a tricky bug. It's the, probably the holy grail of, <laughs> of at least vaccines and probably also diagnostics. And the role of improved diagnostics? Well, yeah, to ensure that the patients in need gets the treatment they uh, deserve, you know, they need access to testing. So we can work out if it's TB and if it's not TB, well, we need to work out what else it is. Yeah. So it's a tough pathogen. You know, it occurs to me about the role of social engagement and how important in HIV, you know, ACT UP and other groups were the patient advocate groups um, mm -hmm. for Ebola, right? The national news media picked it up and it was also the awareness was very high with COVID. The awareness is very high. With tuberculosis, it doesn't seem that there's such a global consensus of the importance and the devastating impact, certainly at a personal level. But um, what are you seeing in terms of the opportunity for, for, for groups, maybe at Stop TB or others, to really help push forward the, the awareness and the importance to, to engage you know, more uh, systematically on fighting tuberculosis? Mm, yeah. I think Stop TB have been quite successful in, in getting uh, TB on the agenda. And I think as a, as a community, we are doing what we can. But it kind of, you know, it is a disease that affects the world's poorest. And those people, you know, have, have less opportunity to, to create that awareness. And it's the role of, of organizations like FIND, WHO, and many, many others to, to, to support these efforts. TB has for many years been the, the biggest killer out there among the infectious diseases. COVID has that leadership role at the moment, but COVID will probably drop again and TB will, will get that position. And I think, you know, we've we come from, from a couple of years now through the pandemic and we've seen what massive investments in diagnostics and vaccines and treatment can, can have on a, on a pathogen or a pandemic, right? So... I think we should come from that and say, well, we need to be much bolder than we have been so far, and we can make that change for TB as well. Yeah, yeah, great, great segue, by the way, Morton, and bringing up the the different population, you know, the lower socioeconomic status. Great comparison, especially to HIV, etc. Morton, we we know that there's a lot of activity at Find right now associated with diagnostics. Can you tell us a bit about the role that Find is playing in this pandemic? So we are we are an NGO. We're based in Geneva. We have country offices in in India and in Vietnam, in South Africa and in Kenya. And we seek to ensure that that there's equitable access to reliable diagnostics around the world. And we do that by working with manufacturers and academic partners, civil society, countries, policymakers, procurers, donors, private sector, even once in a while, health terrorists. Um, <laughs> and, yes. And for TB, we, uh, we work on, on a couple of sort of major work streams. So we try to expand the portfolio of, of sampling types and test platforms. So as an example here, we are we're focusing a lot with partners on, on using tongue swabs instead of sputum, trying to replace uh, the century-old microscopy with urine-based rapid tests. So really innovations on, on sample types and really simple test platforms. We also try to, to support efforts to secure a really diverse and robust portfolio of, of more classic molecular tests for TB, sort of the cartridge-based assays that, that TB experts will know from, from Cephate and Mobile. We're trying to get more manufacturers engaged in this and also to get better drug resistance testing. And this is uh, also involving in sequencing, which uh, has been massively scaled up globally. Uh, through the pandemic and, and probably is right for the picking for, for TB as well. And then finally, we, we support efforts to prevent TB transmission through developing tools for community-based screening and, and interventions for, for early detection of TB, for instance, using artificial intelligence to interpret chest x-rays. And, and that allows us to go to places where there's no radiologists. And in many, many countries across the world, there's no radiologists there. Uh, and less that even care about uh, TB. So if you can replace a human with an artificial intelligence to have those chest x-rays read, you know, that makes a major difference. Um, so these are some examples of, of what we work on. Right. And I know besides those that you've mentioned so far, the things such as masks for collection of samples that 
we've seen you actually model uh, in the not too distant past. And um, so many other things such as rapid methods and simple methods for uh, treatment of TB that are, that are improving mm -hmm. care. Well, but when you stand back and look at what's been going on and what you're involved in, what are the things that, that excite you most about what is happening in uh, TB diagnostics? Yeah, you know, there there is a lot going on at the moment. And I think we can be grateful for for the investment that has happened through through COVID. But ultimately, I think we should seek to to develop tests that are so simple that the patients can can do the test themselves. We've seen this happen through COVID. So I think we should be aspirational and ambitious and really keep the vision there. You know, we saw that happen. Self-testing for COVID became a reality. Uh, why not try to go that way for TB as well? But for the here and now, I think tangible examples for disruptive technologies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the tong swabs combined with portable PCR machines for use at point of care. The bioaerosols, uh, for instance, capturing bacteria and exhaled breath in a, in a face mask, it's really attractive. It needs more work. We are not sure if it, if it carries enough to be a diagnostic. Um, and then also the urine-based TB detection assays using LAM, they are really promising. But, you know, importantly, it's about leveraging the investments from, from, from COVID. COVID is more normalized now and it's more absorbed in sort of the normal health system. The urgency, at least in parts of the world, is going down, right? So it is up to organizations like FIND and, and others to take really the most promising innovations like those battery operated multiplexing PCR machines and, and, and take them into diseases where there's less investment, right? Like TB. These tools have been super effective for, for COVID and several of these can now, you know, test for flu and RS virus and, and COVID in the same sample. Uh, and more and more tests are coming on these platforms uh, and some are even working on TB. So I think if we can take these point of care PCR machines to really lower levels of the healthcare system, um, you know, we can bring them to where the patients actually need diagnosis and we can deliver results, not just for COVID, but potentially also for other diseases. And it doesn't really stop with, uh, with PCR on, on, on some of these instruments can also do what we call immunoassays, measuring of, of biomarkers like CRP, D-dimer and diabetes tests like HbA1c. Uh, so you really have a lot of flexibility coming from, from simple handheld and, and compared to previous generations of instruments, much more affordable as well. So we have huge potential to, to improve diagnosis where patients are seeking care. And we all our stakeholders here and, and including industry have a big role to play to be creative, supportive and make sure those massive investments through COVID is not lost now that COVID is less of, of a global emergency. Um, just a follow up here. Some 20 years ago, we started mm. the introduction of the Cepheid TB test based on PCR. Mm. And that is not a particularly simple assay methodology to run, yeah. as you've already mentioned, sputum, et cetera. And it's not where most people show up in a clinic. Mm. Um, and just, just curious about your vision about how things are changed from the situation now where so much of the testing is send out for advanced testing, supplements of the, the, the microscopy. But what's that going to look like in the future with all these ad, ad new technologies that are coming along? How will that whole ecosystem change? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think one thing is for sure is that there will be diversity now. Previously, we had one test and that led often to shortages and, and issues with uh, yeah, supply chain and, and getting service on instruments, etc. We will come into a, to a future now where there's many other diagnostics that many of them can do the same as, as, as the Cepheid system. Some offer a little bit more better drug resistance testing on, on sort of the same cartridge sputum combination. But hopefully, we will see new sample types coming in on these instruments, like the tongue swab or the bioaerosol and the face masks, for instance. Um, and then comes in these more portable systems, uh, like the PCR machine, the battery operated PCR machines. Uh, and that allows us then to go into the communities, potentially even into the households and test the patients there. 
you know, do much more targeted interventions, uh, put a couple of these on a motorbike and go in and do uh, active case finding in communities. Okay. You know, the, the X-ray, we haven't talked much about X-ray, but the, yeah, I mentioned the AI on, on interpretation of chest X-rays, but it also comes with, uh, with new hardware. Um, portable X-rays uh, systems that weigh perhaps four kilos can be put in a backpack as well. You can actually set up a whole sort of digital radiology uh, suite in, in a tent. Um, mm-hmm. Stuff like that is, is, is coming as well. Um, so yeah, much more diversity, the end of one size fits all. And it's up to now the, the community of, of implementation partners to, to go in and, and, and work out where the ideal fit is for all of these new tools. But when you think about these new uh, sample types and, and even new technologies, for instance, uh, the quantitative cough, mm-hmm. um, what, what types of new information will that present to the, the clinician to make better decisions or, or to others who need to have better information? Yeah, on the cough, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting, uh, you know, almost for free kind of diagnostics through, through a smartphone, right? It's, uh, you know, that offers a lot of, of opportunity if the technology holds, right? And it's, it's up to, to, to everyone now to see how far can we push it. You know, how good does the microphone need to be in the smartphone, et cetera. So that's, that's one. You know, can you use these tools for, for other things like uh, asthma or COPD monitoring in a pocket, right? I think that is really, really interesting as well. And, and I think when you sort of have these much more affordable tools, you can test much more frequently. So it doesn't need to be a perfect test in terms of accuracy. But when we get into sort of these more screening-like tools, uh, you know, frequency combined with, you know, added diagnostic yields, accessibility, uh, you might not have to be as accurate as, as the current targets uh, we used to form for, for sputum-based diagnostics. Mm-hmm. But again, big unanswered questions, huge potential. Martin, this is a fascinating discussion. Let's shift gears a little bit here. And um, one of the challenges uh, with tuberculosis has been the long duration for treatments, the, the, the mm-hmm. many months that it takes for the uh, traditional drug regimens, the fact that in many instances, um, those uh, drugs need to be administered or observed by healthcare professionals, makes it difficult uh, to engage and actually uh, complete uh, the complete treatment course. Um, with the new shorter term duration um, treatments coming, you know, three months, maybe as low as one month, what are your thoughts on the impact that may have on the need for new types of diagnostics? You mentioned self-testing already. Um, you've mentioned uh, the opportunity for cell phones to pick up information. How in your mind do you see all that coming together to enable better adoption and uptake of these uh, shorter duration uh, therapeutic regimens? Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good, but also a big question. I think new treatment opportunities and, and new vaccines probably will require companion diagnostics, right? So it's a really hot topic in the TB community, and we're all trying to sort of tackle it. Uh, luckily, uh, the WHO have seen this coming, and, and they are now developing uh, target product profiles to guide the developers in in the right direction. So looking at TPPs for treatment monitoring, looking at TPPs to to classify patients at the the time of diagnosis. Is this a person who needs four months or three months or six months treatment? And then the final use case they're exploring is is, uh, a test for cure. You know, once you complete your treatment, a test that, that could predict your, your risk of relapse pre-cure. So they're building sort of the, uh, the TPPs around that, uh, and that will guide the developers. We are seeing some new opportunities for treatment monitoring tools coming through the pipeline, tools that can look at the bacillary load in the sputum, but also the fitness of those bacteria. You know, are these dead or half-dead bugs you're picking up there? That is an indication of how efficient the, the treatment is, is working. Also, less high-tech approaches like um, 
uh, chest X-ray and a com like an evaluation how much bacteria there is in the sputum combined with an HIV test is is really a useful measure already proven now to 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 be able to classify the treatment duration uh, needs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we are moving away from sort of classic diagnostics to potentially new tools for dare I say personalized medicine in in TB. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we realized um, over the last couple of years in fighting the pandemic was the critical importance of making sure the technology and the assay developers understood the unmet needs, mm. the use case, the intended use, what's mm. really needed for these mm. products. What's the role of FIND in helping to get that information out to the development community who's now trying to bring new products, um, you know, companion diagnostics to market? Mm. Yeah, we... we... We spend a lot of time guiding uh, guiding developers uh, to to kind of fit their diagnostics to 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 the needs uh, as as we see them, uh, not just sitting up in Geneva, but actually talking to to country partners a lot. You know the the healthcare workers trying to understand what their needs are, and I think the, also the COVID pandemic has taught us a lot about how to develop test the right ways and really engage those that, that will use the tests and also the patients getting their views on that and then take that information, curate it and, and present that to, to the diagnostic developers and say, well, you know, it needs to be a simple tool. It needs to be an affordable tool. If it needs a centrifuge, this is not what we need. We cannot support that, right? We need, uh, you know, for them to go back to the lab and, 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 and figure out an, an easier way to do it. So yes, yeah, so we spend a lot of time engaging with uh, with manufacturers trying to to set the scene for them. Okay. So Morton, I think something that's a, a very well kept secret in, in the community about Find is that you have this amazing network that you've you've helped to create that mm. uh, is essential for manufacturers to engage with in order to get products into the marketplace. In fact we we jokingly say all the time, all paths to TB diagnostics lead through FIND. And I don't think that's too far from true. So uh, we'd like to hear a little bit about how FIND can help manufacturers in, in uh, getting into the marketplace with the products that are so desperately needed. Yeah, so I don't know if it's a well-kept secret, but we at least we, we try to be <laughs> open, collaborative and a stakeholder in a huge global network of, of partners spanning the whole value chain from, from early development, academic partners, all the way up to, you know, big changes in country through, uh, through new diagnostics. Um, so, you know, we have various, uh, in FIND, we have the disease programs uh, where TB is, is, is one of these, but we also have the cross-cutting Units. We have a very strong tech assessment group uh, that looks at uh, at sort of the nuts and bolts of the the diagnostics. Another group takes over from there, where they they say, okay, is this actually ready for uh, commercialization? Is it robust enough? And and all of that. And there's a really well uh, described stage gating there. And we apply these tools together with uh, with the manufacturers. But then we also have our access team and our market team who, who who help manufacturers to understand um, you know the business side of of of, uh, of some of the diseases we work in and you know if you are for instance a us based covid test manufacturer a disease like tb is 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 perhaps not on sort of the the top of your of your priority list but but um, you know we help them to understand the uh, the huge unmet medical need that's out there, the huge market that's out there to make it also a viable uh, approach uh, for them. We can put them in contact with, uh, with key opinion leaders in the countries, implementation partners, uh, and if necessary, uh, facilitate communication with, uh, with policymakers, uh, et cetera. So I think FIND has, uh, has a lot of hats to, to wear. Uh, we do not wear them alone, we wear them in partnership. Right. That's great. Thank you, Martin. We've heard that the fight against tuberculosis has been set back 10 years or more as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Can you share some examples of the more promising accomplishments and diagnostics that we've gained over the last couple of years and perhaps how they might better prepare us and the world for the next global epidemic? Thank you. Uh, yeah, we have been set back uh, years, um, but we've also learned, learned a lot. I think you know, the self-testing for COVID has been really an eye-opener and is inspiring, you know, for, for hepatitis and, and many other diseases, cervical cancer, etc. As I mentioned on the technology side, the point of care molecular technologies are also incredibly promising and they have really been accelerated. Sequencing and the global network around sequencing, I think uh, just studying sort of the story behind the the omicron variant how it was identified and how the information was shared across the world you know it's a really strong example of of global collaboration around a really really complex technology but driven you know a lot by also low and middle income countries digital diagnostics the contact tracing apps the use of ai all of these things also massively accelerated through through COVID, uh, and we've We've also accepted that, right? We've accepted that it was uh, fine to have a contact tracing app on our smartphone, or many of us did. And then I think there's a much better understanding in the general population about diagnostics and the importance of, of, of diagnostics. I can say PCR, and my mom will have an opinion. You know, she didn't have that before. And then there's all the less visible improvements and innovations, which probably will leave a very large and lasting change for diagnostics. We've seen the, the shift to local manufacturing, also in low and middle income countries. We've seen supply chain improvements, um, but also sort of the revolution in manufacturing processes set up by some of these diagnostic manufacturers. The speed, the way they've managed to cut cost and really drive up manufacturing capacity, you know, this, these are generic things that, that, that will sort of spill over into to, to many other diseases, not just uh, COVID. So, yeah, and then behind all of this, all of the networks that have come through, uh, through the pandemic. Um, yeah, so I'm, you know, although I am quite depressed still about the impact of, of COVID on TB, I'm, I'm quite positive from all the innovations uh, and all the changes that, that uh, we have lived through in diagnostics. All of these incredible changes that, which are occurring right now in TB diagnostics are, are just remarkable. But when you think about it, do you have a wish list of things that you would like to have but just simply don't at this point? Yeah, the cough app would be fantastic. A cough app that works yeah. would be great. A self-test for TB, fantastic. Much better drug resistance much better yeah also treatment to link up you know access to sort of that whole package of right? diagnostics and treatment uh, linking that much better uh, much better surveillance um, tb is still a very very tricky disease to to manage uh, in many many countries and we are seeing an increase in, in drug resistance and uh, we are very lucky to have new drugs, um, but, you know, the pipeline is not looking as, as, as promising uh, for the future. So I'm concerned about drug resistance and we really, really need to have a priority on that. Morton, you mentioned the shift to local manufacturing and the revolution in manufacturing processes. Um, however, as we look towards, you know, the waning of this pandemic and we see the global demand for uh, the numbers of tests going down, what are your, some of your thoughts on how um, we might keep this new capacity and these new manufacturing processes engaged and available for some of the other products you mentioned, perhaps for cervical cancer or for hepatitis, et cetera? Yeah, so we are probably facing, we're facing a bit of a gap now. Uh, the market for COVID uh, is... As I understand it, associated with the, for instance, the emergency youth authorization that is there, right? If if that disappears or if the market for COVID testing disappears, many of these 
companies uh, need help to sustain kind of uh, yeah an income. Um, so I think that is a that is a risk. Uh, on the positive side, um, the way many uh, low and middle income countries have have taken up manufacturing of of, of diagnostics, uh, I think is a is a very very positive development. Uh, you know, but we have seen that this uh, can come from the countries as well. We we are sort of switching into to to supporting the. Uh, the local stakeholders in the country to to drive that change, designing diagnostics, etc. India is 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 a fantastic example. The more bio test and and many many other uh, diagnostics that are coming out is, is a very good example of uh, to follow from many countries. Yeah. So Morton, it's very exciting about all the new types of samples that are coming along and their impact. What about the potential impact on on kids, which has always been an issue with TB diagnostics. Yeah, and that is a tricky one. Uh, so we have worked a lot on on stool as an alternative sample type for for, for TB for for pediatrics. So kids have a very not very good at coughing, uh, but they do the TB from the lungs gets up and they swallow it and it kind of passes through the uh, digestive tract and you can pick it up in in the stool. So KNCV and the University of Bordeaux, Fine, many others have, have sort of collaborated on, on establishing stool as a, as a new sample type for, for TB. And it recently got a WHO policy uh, approval. Um, and there's a lot of work happening in, in countries to now implement that, uh, that policy. And I think it's a, it's a major achievement. We are not there yet. We still need uh, to have better diagnostics for, for kids. Urine LAM uh, has the potential as well. Uh, so we need to see these uh, third generation LAM, as we call them, coming through the pipeline and see how what they can do in, in kids. We are also trying to expand the use case for artificial intelligence on, on chest x-rays for, for children. And it's, it's a really, really tricky for, for many manufacturers to, to develop these AI algorithms. They basically do not have access to um, x-rays from, from, from kids. So we're part of a big network of uh, mainly academic uh, clinicians uh, working on pediatric TB who have um, established a really large archive of, of chest x-ray images. It's around 10,000 images and we are sort of splitting that up into to two parts one is a smaller validation set and then we have about uh, 8000 of these chest x-rays we will then uh, work with manufacturers to to kind of develop these uh, algorithms for for pediatrics so uh, we hope to to be able to do uh, some good for 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 really this underserved population do tongue swabs have any potential with kids we don't know we don't know. This is one of the big uh, unknowns. Um, we hope, but we're not sure. So tongue swabs, you know, is it actually the aerosols from the lung or the sputum from the lung that is deposited on the on the tongue, or is it the mycobacteria that that forms part of the biofilm on the back of the tongue? We don't really know. And until we have that answered, it's it's hard to say, right? We do see a correlation with uh, smear microscopy grade and uh, and tongue swab positivity, suggesting that it is more deposited than part of the biofilm, uh, which would lean less towards this being uh, something of value for the kids. Interesting. What do you see as some of the changes which are occurring which should impact the uh, treatment of extrapulmonary TB? Um, yeah, that's a really tricky question as well. Uh, but I think LAM as a biomarker has a lot of potential. It's a glycolipid that uh, forms a large part of the bacterial cell wall. And when the bacteria is sort of being attacked by the immune system, they then get into the circulation and eventually end up in, in the urine. And it doesn't really matter if it comes from uh, brain TB or bone TB or pulmonary TB, it ends in the urine. Um, and there, you know, there's a potential to, to detect it. I think we will probably see some changes also on point of care ultrasound. 
So the ultrasound devices are, are getting very affordable uh, and can be linked to, to smartphones um, as well. And potentially you could develop um, AI algorithms to, uh, to help uh, interpretation of, of, of findings on, on ultrasound. So, you know, ultrasound allows you to, to look for TB uh, in other parts of, of the body. Um, so there might be something there as well. But it's a little bit further up the pipeline. That's very exciting, though. It is. All right. Thank you, Morton. Thank you very much for coming on today. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to speak about TB, to, to talk more about the work we do at Find. Thank you. Thank you again. And I think our audience will be very interested and we learned a lot from you as well. So thanks once again. <laughs> Thank you to Morton for your keen insights on the current status of the various development programs in TB disease diagnostics and therapeutics. As was pointed out, TB has been with us now for thousands of years, and we still do not have a full grasp on the biology of this disease. Even so, great strides are being taken, and we look forward to an exciting near-term future as these new technologies make their way to market. This is Mickey Urday. And this is Rich Thayer. And we look forward to you joining us on our next episode of Holteras Presents. Holteras Presents is produced by Holteras Associates, a U.S.-based bioscience consultancy that provides strategic and tactical services in the areas of diagnostics, medical devices, and life science research to clients of all sizes. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the episode are solely those of the individuals involved, and Holteras Associates is not responsible for any errors or omissions or for the results obtained from the use of this information. The information provided in this episode is for informational or educational purposes only and is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Holteras Associates would like to say thank you to this episode's guests or guests and thank you for listening to this episode of Holteras Presents. Thank you.